Tonight on To The Point, a social media post gaining traction online, accusing a local museum director of reprimanding an employee for wearing a cultural item. We investigate what really happened and how the museum is responding. Two people arrested thousands of miles away accused of killing a Sacramento mother. What her family is saying about who the suspects are. Plus, they're tasked with helping hundreds of homeless people across Sacramento. Meet the team at the center of the city and county outreach program and see firsthand what they do on a daily basis. And later, the TikTok ban bill has passed the House. So what now? And will the president sign it if it hits his desk? But first tonight, we are following breaking news out of Stockton. Thank you so much for joining us. This is To The Point, and I'm Alex Bell. Right now, deputies are searching for a teen who jumped into the Calaveras River after a fight at Stag High School. ABC 10's Luke Cleary is live for us right there tonight. Uh, Luke, what do we know so far? Well, hey, Alex, I'm here on the levee along the Calaveras River, where, as you can see, there's an active search and rescue operation happening right now. They're looking for a teenager who went into the water around 2 o'clock and didn't come back out. We can see at least three of those San Joaquin County search and rescue boats right now. They say that they're using a search and rescue robot, and from time to time we've seen the outline of that orange device bobbing up and down from the murky and uh, cold Calaveras River. I want to show you some video that we took earlier today from the ABC 10 drone, which should give you some idea of how close this river is to Stag High School, where this all began. Again, around 2 o'clock when school officials say that the, and an altercation broke out between these two teenagers, potentially students, after administrators tried to break it up to approach them. Uh, those two teenagers went running toward the levee into the water. One of them emerged, the other did not. And so this search and rescue operation continues here. I've been speaking with a couple of family members who were watching this unfold here quite anxiously. They hope that their nephew uh, is either hiding or continued running and that he is not uh, anywhere near this water right now. We'll continue to work our sources with the county sheriff's office and uh, with the school district to learn more as we watch this search and rescue unfold. But for now, Alex, back to you. All right, Luke, thank you so much. And you already know we will continue to follow this story. You can get updates sent straight to your phone with our ABC 10 app. A Sacramento museum is facing criticism after a post on Instagram accused museum leaders of banning employees from wearing a traditional Palestinian scarf, calling it too political. We heard from community members asking for clarification on this. So Becca Habegger looked into the controversy and has answers for us tonight. The Smud Museum of Science and Curiosity, or MOSAC, here in Sacramento, is the subject of an Instagram post Monday by the account Change the Museum, which says it pressures U.S. museums to move beyond lip service proclamations by amplifying tales of unchecked racism. The post tells the story of an anonymous employee and says it has this employee's permission to do so, saying, in part, I work at the Museum of Science and Curiosity. Last month, an Arab staff member wore a Palestinian keffiyeh to work and was advised by a director to reconsider their clothing choice. The next week, more co-workers donned keffiyeh in support of these actions and to stand up for Palestinians who are being dehumanized, starved, and bombed relentlessly. Those employees were each pulled into private meetings and interrogated about the kafiyas, what it meant to them, and were reprimanded for hurting the feelings of an Israeli director. Soon after, a new policy prohibiting clothing, apparel, or other visible symbols that make a political statement was sent to all staff by email without context. The post goes on to describe several employees feeling uncomfortable with the policy and asking how it would be applied equitably. We reached out to Mossack, asking them to confirm these events and explained the actions leadership took. In a statement, the museum told ABC 10, Mossack's highest priority is to maintain a safe and respectful environment where our employees and guests can engage in science, learning, and fun. We do not tolerate discrimination of any kind, and we evaluate and update our policies regularly to ensure the museum is inclusive and welcoming for all. They also sent us their policy on respectful work environment, which says, in part, in order to continue to create a safe, respectful, inclusive, and thriving environment that is welcoming for all staff and visitors, staff will not be allowed to wear or display clothing, apparel, or other visible symbols that make a political statement while on Mossack property. With conflicts happening throughout the world and the political season that is upon us, it's especially important that we all respect each other's beliefs and not use the workplace as a platform to promote them. This is another example of uh, culture of censorship and cancellation and, and uh, 
silencing. Yassar Dabur is chair of Palestine American League and lives in Elk Grove. The kofiya, which I'm wearing right now, this is a traditional Palestinian. He says a Palestinian kofiya is both a political statement and a cultural piece of clothing. He says he believes telling employees they can't wear a kofiya in the workplace is a suppression of free speech. I encourage people to actually stand up for themselves and to uh, fight it off because this is uh, freedom of expression. Becca Habegger with us right now. Becca, what do we know about that employee who was the first to wear that Palestinian scarf? Yeah, you know, Alex, the local CARE or Council on American Islamic Relations chapter says they are in touch with that staff member to offer support through the services they provide. And another question, you checked in with other organizations too, what they have to say? Yeah, you know, if you recall, MOSAC getting that built was a process that spanned some 15 years. Over that time, the city, county, SMUD, it's in the name, and others were involved. I did reach out to them for the story, but they, again, including SMUD in the name, directed us back to the museum leadership, saying the museum now operates independently from all of them, and they have no part in the day-to-day -day operations. All right, Becca, thank you so much. We appreciate it. For more than three hours today, hundreds of protesters demanding a ceasefire in Gaza block the international terminal at SFO. Part of the off-ramp to the terminal was impacted along with two security checkpoints, and demonstrators say it was part of a global day of action to demand a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and to end U.S. financial support for Israel's military. While the terminal remained open, some passengers had to be rerouted, and airport officials say things ended peacefully and no arrests were made. In other news, Davis stabbing suspect Carlos Dominguez pled not guilty today in a Yolo County courtroom. He's accused of killing two men in city parks last year and then brutally attacking a woman, leaving her seriously wounded. The 22-year-old pled not guilty to all charges today and waived his right to a speedy trial. And this comes after a judge said that there is probable cause showing he committed the crimes and intended to kill. Now, Dominguez is due back in court on June 18th when a trial date will be set. Tonight, the family of a Sacramento mother killed right on Valentine's Day say that they can rest easy after the two suspects in the shooting are finally in custody. 26-year-old Chastity Sparkman was shot and killed in the Lake Crest Village Shopping Center right in the pocket neighborhood. And Roxanne Elias has followed the story since the day it happened and joins us tonight. Roxanne. Alex, I spoke with Sparkman's aunt, Dee Dee, who answered my call today by saying she was so, so excited to hear the suspects were finally caught. And Dee Dee was also granted custody of Sparkman's six and eight-year-old children in case anything ever happened to her. The family has gone through every emotional possible where, while Sparkman's aunt, Dee Dee, remains strong for the kids. Sacramento police said Tuesday night, Isaiah James and Ayana Borgos were taken into custody in New York City. Police have not confirmed the relationship between the suspects and Sparkman, but Aunt Dee Dee confirmed with us today that the pair are Sparkman's husband and his girlfriend. She found out about the arrest after Sparkman's funeral and right before her services. Dee Dee says the two children Sparkman left behind both jumped for joy after learning about the arrest and the family is now at peace. We also spoke to the family back in February when they called on the suspects to turn themselves in. Take a listen is to do the right thing <laughs> so we have our closure. She deserves that. She deserves it. She was such a light. <laughs> she didn't deserve to die the way she died. Police say both suspects face extradition to Sacramento from for homicide-related charges. The family is waiting to hear about the next steps in the case. And now to continuing coverage of the city county joint homeless agreement. The progress report of their first year was released, meeting 23 of 28 goals. And ABC 10's Devin Truby sat down with the leader of each side to find out what's next and joins the team on the streets of Sacramento to see the work that's physically being done. Alex, today we saw in action the outreach part of the city and county homeless agreement, the part where they were able to reach all of their goals for the year. Anybody home? Just coming by to see if folks are anybody interested in getting connected to services. Me 
Justin Hernandez. He's one of Sacramento County's 12 mental health workers assigned to the Homeless Engagement and Response Team, or HART, a team created by an agreement between the City of Sacramento and the county. We've been able to pull more resources together, um, so, we're, so our team is able to focus a lot on the behavioral health and the substance use, and our other partners are able to focus on some of those more immediate resources, like whether it's shelter, whether it's just, you know, water. The 10 teams have been working for a year, visiting more than 5,000 locations, meeting the unhoused where they are. I want to start with an uh, ID card. Connecting with people like Soleil, who's been homeless off and on for eight years. I know the services are getting better, like from what they used to be. Justin estimates he's visited 100 sites, seen over a thousand people. While you can see the Hart team working here across Sacramento, it's hard to see what progress has been made. Just to be patient with us and, you know, see that we're just trying to help go out and help people and it's, it's definitely going to be a process. You know, there's a lot of sentiment that, you know, we have to, you know, get folks off the street, which is, I, I think is very important, but it, 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 it takes time. Assistant City Manager Mario Lara and Deputy County Director Siobhan Katari, they wish residents could see more progress. Yes, we don't see a dent in it because of the, 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 the volume and, and, the, and the size of the problem, but I am confident that we are making some progress and chipping away, even if it's not as visible as we would like it to be. We also asked about the lack of accountability in this agreement for the areas they did fall short, like training and education. I do a weekly report to the council from our IMT team that talks about, you know, we're holding ourselves accountable, that we're going out there, we're making sure that every day, every day we're, report, we're recording those numbers. The partnership openly admits they need to do a better job collecting data and being transparent. One lesson learned this year is that we really need to do a better job with our data, with collecting our data and with really ensuring that the community, our electeds, have access to real-time data about the work that we're doing. All right, and still head on to the point, the bill threatening to ban TikTok in the U.S. moving through the House, why lawmakers say it's a threat to national security. Winds have continued to increase for today, tracking a wind advisory and high wind warning for the rest of the week. Well, if you left the house at all today, you definitely felt oh. the wind. We were flying a drone earlier, and I was like, okay, oh. we got to land it. It's a little too windy. <laughs> yes, indeed, and those winds are just starting to pick up right now. In fact, our peak winds hit us overnight tonight through tomorrow. Wind advisory in place for the valley. That continues until 5 o'clock on Friday. And then for the high country, our high wind warning goes into effect tonight at 11 o'clock. That, too will be in effect until Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. Basically, what we're looking at is that high pressure ridge starting to build in. That's going to dry us out, warm us up as we head into the weekend. But that departing low that brought us the showers yesterday, settling into the Great Basin, creating those strong offshore winds. Temperatures for tonight holding fairly steady. Those winds tend to keep that warmer air closer to the surface. So even at 10 p.m., we're still going to be at 56 degrees. Current winds are out of the north at 15 to 20 miles per hour. And again, those will continue to pick up, as too will the gusts. Current wind gusts at about 30 to 35 miles per hour. As that low starts to settle in, we get those windy conditions. And that setup stays in place all the way through our Friday. So you can see here how winds will start to transform overnight tonight through tomorrow. It's going to be a breezy morning commute. Watch, watch out for those high profile vehicles, especially along the Yellow Causeway up through the high country where our wind gusts could reach over 70 miles per hour. That only for this year. Again, that's where we'll see those dangerous conditions. We get another little pulse of those winds coming through on Friday during the midday hours, and then we'll start to wind things down. Highs for tomorrow close to 40 for the Sierra 50s and 60s through the foothills with 60s to near 70 across the coast. We'll see those temperatures as well throughout the valley. Our five day regional forecast. We have the winds to contend with through Friday. So if you're headed up to the high country, might want to check ahead to make sure that those ski resorts have those lifts operating with those gusty winds. After that, lighter winds, gorgeous temperatures heading into St. Patrick's Day. All right, thanks, Monica. Next on to the point, the bill threatening to ban TikTok in the U.S. moving through the house, its next steps, and what it could mean for your usage. And then AT&T applies to drop landlines in California, the impact it could have on rural areas. Plus, could a tax be the solution to the housing problem in South Lake Tahoe? The new proposal and what it could mean for some homeowners. Could the social media app TikTok be banned in the U.S.? In a major move by Congress today, the House passing a bill that would ban TikTok if its parent company, ByteDance, 
does not sell the app. And lawmakers say there are security concerns with the company's ties to the Chinese government. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed. One step closer to a TikTok shutdown. TikTok is a threat to our national security. Today, the House overwhelmingly passing a bill that would ban TikTok if its parent company, ByteDance, doesn't sell the app in the next six months. This is not an attempt to ban TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tic-tac-toe. A winner. The app has about 170 million users in the United States. That's more than half of the American population. I use TikTok a lot. It kind of just like keeps me informed. It helps me be aware of more activism as well as like issues going on in the community. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill say their issue is not with TikTok, but rather they are concerned about ByteDance, a company in China, and its ties to the Chinese government. Lawmakers say ByteDance could share user data with the Chinese government, and China could control what Americans see and do not see on their phones. TikTok is owned by ByteDance. ByteDance is in China. And when you're in China, you have to do whatever the Chinese Communist Party says you have to do. A TikTok spokesperson says they have never shared user information with the Chinese government. This is a Pandora's box. What's to stop Congress or the United States government in the future from forcing the sale of another social media company claiming that it's protecting Americans' data from foreign adversaries. The bill now goes to the Senate. If it passes there, it heads to the president to sign it into law. If they pass it, I'll sign it. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he will review the bill and he is not committed to putting it up for a vote. Top Senate intelligence leaders are pushing for a vote, citing the national security threats. And in your price points tonight, AT&T has applied to end its landline phone obligations in California, causing protests among customers who say that they rely on the service. As the California Public Utilities Commission considers the company's request, AT&T officials have been talking to residents in town hall meetings. And this was the scene at one yesterday in Yolo County. People living there grilled AT&T California President Mark Blakeman. The company wants to transition cu customers from copper to internet-enabled networks, and neighbors and the Yolo County Board of Supervisors oppose the application, saying that rural customers don't have other reliable options and count on landline phones for emergency services in times of natural disasters. The copper landline is actually their, their primary source of communication with the outside world. And here's what AT&T California President Mark Blakeman had to say about that concern. We're going to continue to serve them with their copper phone lines until viable alternatives become available. And if that doesn't become available, then we will continue to have that obligation to serve them. And we want to mention that AT&T says it will take years to transition. For now, customers will not be disconnected. The next public hearing is set for March 19th. South Lake Tahoe has a housing problem. Many people living there feel that they're getting priced out of town. And now one group is proposing a new tax that they think could help solve the problem. So it's called the vacancy tax and would add an annual fee on houses that sit empty for most of the year. Owners of vacant houses that are unoccupied more than six months per year would pay $3,000 for the first year and $6,000 every year thereafter. It could also require every owner of a residential unit in the city to submit an annual declaration. And while the group behind the initiative thinks it will help fund the local economy, others feel it unfairly targets people who have extra properties. If this is implemented as written, I see second homes, many who have been in families for generations, being sold to wealthy folks who have the money to just pay the fine. According to the text of the proposed initiative, the taxes imposed would be used for funding for the creation and operation of local housing, road infrastructure, transit infrastructure, and related programs. And there are 1,500 signatures needed from registered voters by April 10th to make it on that November ballot. All right, dozens of you reached out to us about your EBT benefits being stolen, and now we are getting answers, a preview of our investigation right after this break. Criminals are getting smarter and smarter every day, and now they are preying on the most vulnerable. And it's costing you, the taxpayer, millions of dollars. Here's a preview of what we're working on for tomorrow. The state's most vulnerable left with nothing. It was over $700, almost $800, gone, wiped out completely. 
I called in and was told there's zero dollars and zero cents on your card. I went to try to pull the money out to go pay the rent and it wouldn't let me. Millions of your taxpayer dollars depleted from EBT cards. Our state loses about eight to ten million dollars every month. We are dealing with professional organized crime rings that are working up and down the state. What's being done to fix the problem and stop the fraud? Don't miss this special investigation on To the Point with Alex Bell. Thursday at 6.30, only on ABC 10. Again, don't forget, you can catch our full investigation at 6.30 right here on To The Point. And you already know, if you have something you think we should be looking into, make sure you reach out to me and the team. We love getting to tell your stories and, of course, getting to meet you. Remember, strangers are just people we haven't gotten to know yet, so make sure you take the time to get to know someone. Have a great night, and I'll see you later. Hey, it's Alex. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. The To The Point team and I love hearing from you, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. And don't forget, you can always email me and the team at tothepoint at abc10.com, or you can even send us a text message at 916-321-3310.